Okay. Are you ready now for some more meat that will really humble us and prepare us with an attitude of contrition, brokenness, and humility before the Lord Jesus? Because we cannot love him enough. We cannot glorify him enough. We need to do more because of what he did for us. So let's talk about what took place on Good Friday and why is it good when something bad happened to the Son of God? Don't forget who Jesus is. He's the only son, only begotten son, the firstborn of the Father, who was hanging on the cross on Passover, the feast, the festival of Passover, okay? The festival, the feast of Passover. We already saw that Jesus is called the only begotten son. Let's see where he's called the firstborn. Hebrews 1, verse 6. Here we go. Hebrews 1, verse 6. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Ooh, the firstborn, right? Yep, the firstborn. Okay. So guys, get ready to be blown away. Firstborn is our Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten son. Okay. He is hanging on the cross. He's hanging on the cross on the festival of Passover. God's firstborn, only begotten, only son is dying on the cross on the festival of the Jews, the festival of Passover, the feast of Passover. Okay. Now, don't forget Passover, firstborn, firstborn, okay, hanging on the cross. And then we read, if we go to Matthew 27, 45, Mark 15, 33, darkness came upon the land from noon to 3 p.m., six hour to ninth hour, Jewish reckoning, that's noon to 3 p.m. Noon is when it's the brightest and the hottest time of the day, right? So if you want to read that, brother, either Mark 15, 33 or Matthew 27, 45. Go with Mark. Here we go. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Don't forget the time. Sixth hour is noon, Jewish time. That's why NIV will tell you noon. Yep. Ninth hour is 3 p.m. So from noon to 3 p.m., the festival of the Jews, the festival of Passover, the feast, God's firstborn hung on the cross, dying. Okay. Now, get ready to be blown away. Let's go to Exodus 10, 21 to 23. Exodus 10, 21 to 23. I got a lot of meat. So bear with me, guys. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Okay, guys, is it a coincidence? The second to last plague is pitch darkness over the land for three days. Then you have the slaying of the Passover lamb, and then the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians. Let me repeat it again. Darkness over the land, the Passover slain, and the death of the firstborn. What takes place on Good Friday? Darkness over the land during the Passover, and the firstborn of God is slain. Now, notice another thing, how this points to Jesus' resurrection on the third day. How many days did the darkness last? Three days, right? Three days. Three days, right? All right. Can you read John 8, 12? Tell me who Jesus is. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have light, have the light of life. Okay, now Jesus is the light of the world. Luke twenty two fifty three. 53. Here we go. Yeah. Luke twenty two fifty three. When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. The light of the world was engulfed by darkness for three days, and then he rose again. Notice darkness on the land, leading up to the slaughter of the Passover, to the death of the firstborn. Is it a coincidence Jesus is God's firstborn? 
who's hanging on the cross and dying, who's also the Passover, our Passover lamb, who's being slain on the Passover, the Feast of Passover, and darkness over the land. You see how everything is pointing to Jesus Christ. Everything is pointing to Jesus Christ. But now let's go a little deeper. Let's go a little deeper. It's the festival of the Jews. It's the feast of the Jews. The firstborn of God is dying on the cross. The only begotten Son of God is dying on the cross during the feast of the Jews. And it becomes dark at noon. At noontime. Now let's go to Amos chapter 8 verses 9 to 10. Amos chapter 8 verses 9 to 10. Let's explain the darkness and its significance. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feast into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son, and its end like a bitter day. Okay, again, brother, one more time, read for them. Amos 8, verse 9 and 10, a sign of God's judgment on the land. Pay attention. How do you know God is angry and he's pouring out judgment on a people or a land? Here are the signs again. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist, and baldness in every head, I will make it like mourning for an only son, and its end like a bitter day. So notice what Amos said is a clear sign of God's judgment upon his people. The land will go pitch dark at noon during their festivals, one of their feasts, and he'll make them mourn as the morning of losing an only son. Now let me explain why the Lord says only son. Because in Israelite society, your son is your heir. If you have no son, you have no heir, your line is cut off. So when your only son dies, that was considered a great judgment and curse of God upon you. That God is so sick and disgusted with you, let's say, that your only heir dies, leaving you heirless and cutting off your line. So it's considered very bitter. Now, guys, is it a coincidence during the Feast of the Jews, the Festival of the Jews, Passover, God's only son hangs on the cross, perishing, and it becomes dark at noon. All of the signs Amos said would be present if God was pouring out judgment and wrath. Everyone got it? So Amen. then the question needs to be asked, who is taking the judgment of God? Who is the one who's experiencing God's judgment? Jesus Christ is suffering the place of sinners who deserve that judgment, a judgment he doesn't deserve, but he's suffering in our place so we can be spared. So that's what the darkness signified. Everyone understand what the darkness signified? That darkness from noon to 3 p.m. signified God's judgments being poured out. But upon who? Jesus is now suffering the judgment we deserve in our place voluntarily so that we can escape God's wrath and be spared if we turn to him. That's what darkness meant. That's what took place on Good Friday. But now let me ask a follow-up question. Why then did the darkness end at the ninth hour, 3 p.m. afternoon? Why did it end at the ninth hour, 3 p.m.? Okay, here we're going to go into a little more meat Something that many people don't see the connection. Go back to brother in Mark 15, since you read the Mark inversion. Go back to Mark 15. We're going to read 33, 34, but first read 33. Here we go. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, if you guys don't read carefully, astutely, asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds, to go into the depth of Scripture, okay, if you don't read carefully, you won't make the connection. It says, 6th hour noon to ninth hour, 3 p.m., there was darkness. 
And then the darkness subsided. Why? The answer is 34. Mark is now explaining why. Because right around the ninth hour, 3 p.m., Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark and Matthew, who records this, want the readers to see it's Jesus' prayer at the ninth hour that results in the darkness being removed and the judgment ending. So let me try it. Let me repeat it again. Because I got to make sure you're paying attention. It's Jesus' prayer at the ninth hour that results in the darkness being removed as a sign that the judgment is over, the price has been paid, God is fully satisfied. Now, how do I know it's Jesus' prayer? Two reasons. Number one, is it a coincidence that he prayed at the ninth hour, the very hour darkness was removed? No, it's his prayer that results in it. But secondly, the Lord is uttering the words of Psalm 22. Let's go to Psalm 22 and unpack it. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Okay, did you catch it, brother, before you move on? The words of our Lord at the ninth hour are the words of Psalm 22. Now read Psalm 22 one more time. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning. Okay, so now let me explain what this means. The Lord is not saying, why have you abandoned me? Like, uh, how do I explain? He's not saying, oh, why you have No, no, no. If you read the context, the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is actually the Lord saying, why are you far from delivering me? Why are you far from my cries and answering me to deliver me from the judgment? It's not a cry of despair. It's a cry of, all right, I have now experienced the suffering that sinners deserve. I have now paid the price in full. How much more longer will you delay in delivering me? How much more longer will I be left in judgment now that the price is paid? So it's actually a question that expects and demands a response, meaning it's done, it's over, the price has been paid, you have paid the price in full, you've now reconciled God and man because of you voluntarily taking the punishment of sin, the suffering of sin, and to prove that's the meaning, go and read Psalm 22, verses 23 to 24. Here we go. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. Did you catch it? The psalm is telling you this is the question that results in the judgment ending and Christ <clears throat> being reconciled. When I say reconciled, in other words, Christ now paying the price and returning to the Father's heavenly presence. You see? It's right there. So it's not a cry of abandonment. Oh, why are you? No, no, that's not it. It's it's basically, if I were to capture the gist of what Jesus is doing, it's right here, Psalm 22. Father, I have now taken the suffering, the penalty of what sinners deserve. I have now satisfied the divine wrath. I've absorbed the cup, the cup. The price is paid. The judgment is over. Time for me to come home. And the father says, yes, son, it is time. This is the meaning of his prayer. So I don't want Christians to misrepresent the prayer saying Christ was crying out because he felt abandoned, despairing. No, that's not the context of the words no. as proven from the psalm itself. I just want to make sure everyone's getting it. These are not the words of a man who's despairing. It's the words of confidence. It's the words of assurance. I have now drunk from the cup, fully and completely. The judgment that sinners deserve, I have gladly and voluntarily taken it. I have suffered the pain, the alienation, the death that sinners deserve in order to spare them if they turn to me. I have satisfied the justice of God. Father, it's time for me to come home. That's the intent and import of the prayer. 
Again, brother, in case they don't see that and they think I'm reading too much into it, read again Psalm 22, 23 to 24. One more time. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the afflicted affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. So there you go. Don't let anyone, Christian or unbeliever, misinterpret the words of our Lord. They're not a cry of abandonment, despair, or fear. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The psalmist is Jesus speaking by the Spirit through David. And so the same speaker in 22 verse 1 is the same one who tells you in 24, Praise God, rejoice with me, because when I cried, he heard me. Why? Because I am righteous, I am perfect, and I always please him, and he always answers me. Did it sink in? Jesus gets everything he asks from the Father. Not some things, not most things. Everything he asks, he gets. Because he perfectly satisfies the Father, delights the Father, and the Father who loves and adores the Son rushes to do everything the Son asks of him. Go to John 11, 20 to 22. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. See that? I know who you are. You're the son of God, that whatever you ask, God will give you. He'll give you everything you ask. Now, does Jesus say you're wrong? I'm like the rest. Sometimes I get what I want. Sometimes I don't. Let's read John 11, 41 to 44. Notice verse 42. John 11, 41 to 44. Notice verse 42. Then they took, the took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by. I Sometimes you hear me, brother. What does 42 say? Emphasize that. You, Sometimes you always hear me all the time. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with the grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. Okay, now, guys, did you see? Jesus agrees. The Father always does what I ask, always gives me what I demand, because he loves me and adores me and rushes to answer my prayers. Did you guys catch that? Everyone got it, right? You see that? Amen. So then, is it a coincidence that the darkness subsided 3 o'clock p.m., Right after Jesus said the words of Psalm 22, which is a psalm, not of despair, but of confidence, because I'm the righteous one, God will hear me and will deliver me. You Amen, see? brother. And I think you a really good point that you're bringing up there, because not many people realize it. And you know very well, Muslim debaters yes. will always bring it up. Yes, exactly. But I'm going to go a little further to unpack this. By the way, side note, do you see when... Lazarus came out, come out, he was bound, head and foot. What did Jesus say? Loose him and let him go. Yep. Let me bring up the spiritual implication. When Jesus raises the dead, that's when he looses you and sets you free from bondage to death. Death no longer has control over you. So you can take the words, loose him and let him go, to mean the wrappings, loose the wrappings, let him go, which is that what it means? Or you can see also a deeper meaning. I have loosed you from death. Death must let you go because I'm the resurrection life who destroys the power and dominion of death over those who believe in me. You got it? Boom. Now, to further show you that God the Father always does what the Son asks because he always pleases the Father, read for us John 7, 18. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. Because there's no unrighteousness in Jesus, the Son of God. This is why Jesus says in John 8, 29, the following. John 8, 29. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, 
For I always do those things that please him. Not sometimes. I always please him. Always do things to please him, which is why he always answers me, which is why the Father himself says in Mark 1.11, the following. Here we go. Here it is. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What, what else do you guys want? Here Jesus says, I always please the Father. I always delight his heart. I always do what he wants because that's all I can do. And the Father always hears me, always does what I demand because he loves me, delights in me, and rushes to do all that I request. You see? It's right there. Amen. You got it right there. So again, why was the darkness removed? It was removed because of Jesus' prayer. When the Father heard the Son cry out in the words of Psalm 22, that was the prayer that moved the Father to remove the darkness, remove the judgment, because the Son had perfectly accomplished redemption. End of story. Now, it's not a coincidence that Jesus prayed at 3 p.m., ninth hour. Let's see the significance. Go Amen. now to Acts 3, verse 1. Why the ninth hour? Why 3 p.m.? Acts 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. The ninth hour. What hour was the hour of prayer? The ninth hour. What hour did Jesus cry out on the cross? The ninth hour, right? Mark 15, 34. Yep. Notice Jesus cried out at the ninth hour, 3 p.m., the exact hour of the evening prayer and sacrifice in the temple. Notice it's not a coincidence. The Lord could have cried out at the eighth hour. He could have cried out at the tenth hour. Yep. The Lord deliberately chose the ninth hour, the exact hour of the evening time of prayer and sacrifice, because at the temple, they would have morning and evening sacrifices and prayers. The morning prayer and sacrifice took place at the third hour, 9 a.m. The evening sacrifice and prayer took place at the ninth hour, 3 p.m. So when Jesus cried out at the ninth hour, 3 p.m., he deliberately chose that hour because he was acting as our high priest who was offering himself as the evening sacrifice to the Father, praying the words of Psalm 22. Now let's wrap it up with further proof that Psalm 22 is all about Jesus. So it's Jesus speaking throughout the Psalm, not David. Jesus is simply using David's mouth to speak these words by the Spirit. So it's Jesus speaking. Let's go to Psalm twenty-two, sixteen. 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. David has never been pierced. In fact, Piercing via crucifixion was an un unknown method of execution at the time of David, who wrote this a thousand years before the birth of our Lord. Historically, you'll find crucifixion being implemented 500 years later, 500 years before our Lord by the Medes Parthians, Medes Persians, the Parthians, and then adopted by the Romans. So the first proof, it's about Jesus. Not only the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, are by Christ, the piercing of the hands and feet never happened to David. Now read Psalm 22, 17 and 18, brother. Here we go. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now notice this perfectly describes the positioning of a body on a cross. Notice it says in verse 17, you see what it said? It said, I can count all my bones. Why? Because in that position, your body is stretched and your bones stick out. Right? Yeah. I can see my bones from this being stretched on the cross. But then notice it says, they divided my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Now, brother, go to John 19, 23 to 24. John 19, so, 23 to 24. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. 
Christ Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Sorry, read that last part again. I'm sorry, brother. Where it says scripture must, must be fulfilled. Yep, here we go. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, Therefore the soldiers did these things. Christ is king. Why are you asking me the question? Come on, brother. You're sharper than that. Who else but Jesus could be speaking these words? When did David's clothing and garments, when were they divided and they cast lots for his garments? When was David pierced his hands and feet? When did David cry out? Of course it's Jesus, brother. Come on, read it. It's right there. It's Jesus speaking. Yep. Right. Couldn't be anybody else, brother. And let me give you further proof. It's Jesus and only Jesus. Go back to Psalm 22 now, brother. Read 4 all the way to 8. Our Father is trusted in you. They trusted you and, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Don't forget what you just read. They're going to mock him. They're going to shake their heads, wag their heads at him. like, Shh. And they're going to say, he trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him, rescue him since he delights in him. Remember these words. Let's see what they did to Jesus on the cross. Go to Matthew 27, brother. Read Amen. 38 to 44. Matthew 27, 38 to 44. Here we go. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, yet he himself cannot, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Is that Even... coincidence? Now read 44, brother. Read 44. Here you go, brother. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now read 43 one more time for them to see. These are the words you just read in Psalm 22, verse 8. Amen, brother. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Did everyone pay attention that the very words of the psalmist, he says that they wagged their heads at me, they mocked me. And they said, he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him now, seeing that he delights in him. These are the words that you just read were uttered against Jesus on Good Friday when he hung on the cross. And David wrote this a thousand years before our Lord was conceived by the Blessed Virgin. Everyone Amen, got brother. it? Everyone got it or no? Are you seeing Psalm 22? It's Jesus in his pre-human existence speaking by the Spirit through the mouth of David. It has nothing to do with David. It's Jesus speaking. It could not have. Correct me if I'm wrong, brother. But historically, it could not have had no. anything to do with David. Even liberal critical scholars who try to connect with David, they cannot show you these events in the life of David. Challenge him. Say, okay, show me where this happened to David, where they mocked him and said he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Show me where they divided his garments and cast lots for his clothing. Show me. Show it to me. In his in the historical narratives, this, it never happened because it's not about David. It's all about Jesus. Now, the icing on the cake, and we're done. Here, you're going to see the post-resurrected Christ speaking. Psalm 22, 22. Psalm 22, 22, and now I'm going to wrap it up. And Lord willing, I have more in next session, God willing. Amen, brother. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Say it again. What is he going to do? Psalm 22, 22. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Okay, now, before you go on, they, uh, Barack O'Niner, you know I'm going to block you right now. I'm going to block you, and you wonder why you're blocked on my other channel. How did David die? Wasn't it like this? I'm going to block you for making that comment because, again, shows that you keep asking questions without thinking about it, without studying Scripture. I will give you a million bucks if you show me how David died like this, and you can do it as how I block you for that comment. Unbelievable, the stuff you say. 
that that is shocking, brother. Where on earth? I mean, there's nobody that would even say that. No, no, not even any liberal historical scholar would say that. Yeah, it really, really angers me when Christians can make comments like that. That shows again the level of biblical literacy. But anyway, God have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, forgive us for not knowing your word and living for you. Have mercy on us, Lord. Now, Psalm 22, 22, one more time, so we can wrap it up. I will declare yeah. your name. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. Okay, how is this a proof of the post-resurrected Jesus speaking, that this is Jesus speaking after his resurrection? Hebrews 2, verse 12, but we're going to read 9 to 12. Hebrews 2, verse 12, but 9 to 12. Guys, pay attention to see if these are the words of the resurrected Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren, in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. Okay, brother, I'm confused. Did you not just read Hebrews 2.12 somewhere? Uh, I mean, it really sounds a lot like what we just read a minute ago, brother. See, so when did Jesus utter the words of Psalm 22.22 according to Hebrews? Guys, when did he utter it? You see, after his resurrection, when he appeared to the apostles and proclaimed to them, his resurrection and glorified the father with them in their midst so psalm 22 verse 22 according to the new testament is the post resurrected the risen lord jesus appearing to the disciples in their midst to glorify the father with them because of the father delivering him after perfectly accomplishing their redemption amen there you go so that's why darkness on the land and everything showing God's perfect sovereign power over creation, everything in the Old Testament designed by God to point to Jesus, and even on the cross, Jesus is in control over his destiny because he's the sovereign Lord God of creation, one with the Father and the Spirit. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Son of God. Pray for me, my daughters. Pray the Lord will bring them to me. I haven't Amen. heard from them in a while, that he'll keep them safe. Pray the Lord will help me to get healthier, keep me safe and in love with Jesus and provide. Brother, Happy Easter. Happy resurrection. Lord happy willing, Easter, I will brother. see you next week. Christ is risen. Risen indeed. What they say Amen. in Greek, they say Christos, Christos Anesti.